Father, every time we open your word, we want to be impressed with the fact that it is your word. We want to stand in awe of the truth that you've revealed about yourself and about your workings through your people through the ages. We realize, Father, that we on our own, we do not naturally have the ability to even comprehend how great you are and the great truth that you've revealed to us in this world. We pray, Father, that even as you open Lydia's heart to hear what Paul had to say on that faithful day in her life, we pray that you open our hearts, that today and every day that we open your scriptures, that we would give heed to the things you have said, and that we would be changed by it. Bless us today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You want to open your Bible to Acts chapter 2. I want to make up your heart all over. Acts chapter 2 is a passage I want to look at for just a few minutes this morning because Churches of Christ historically have spent so little time in Acts chapter 2. Um, now actually, this passage is very important in the heritage that Churches of Christ have, but I want to look at it with you today maybe in a little bit different way than you have before. Churches of Christ like to talk a lot about patterns, and there are a lot of different patterns in the Bible. Now, I want to look at a passage with you today that shows us the first church of believers, the first community of people who had faith in Jesus Christ and committed themselves wholly to surrendering their lives to his authority and their lives to his will. And I want us to look at this early church in Jerusalem as a community of believers, as a family of people who love God and whose lives are changed by the love that God has for them. And I want to suggest to you that this is a model of what God can do and is doing in His churches today. And that what restricts that is not God, but is instead all of us. The people that are involved in these church communities, we're the ones that get in the way frequently and, and, and hinder the work that God is trying to do. I want us to start in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, and I want us to read through the end of the chapter. This is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. You remember the Holy Spirit is come and filled the disciples. They're speaking in languages that they've never studied. And now the, the audience is wondering, are these men drunk? It's the first time in history that drunkenness produced intelligible speech. But um, no, Peter says this is not drunkenness. This is what the prophet Joel prophesied. This is what was foretold. These are the events where God is breaking into space and time and acting in a decisive way. So let's pick up in verse 22. Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Be saved from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That is a powerful passage about what God did among that audience on the day of Pentecost there in Acts chapter 2 and what he continues to do as the narrative of Acts advances you see this same type of pattern repeated again and again and again. Now, you don't see many days in the church's history, maybe only one, where 3,000 respond to the gospel message as they did on that day. But the same type of transformative experience that you see in the lives of these believers is seen again in chapter 3, in chapter 5, in chapter 6, in chapter 8, in chapter 12, and on and on and on as you go through the history of Acts. This is what God is seeking to do. He's not trying to found a new club. And he's not trying to initiate some kind of a, a cold, dead, ritualistic tradition. What he's trying to do, and what he is doing, is changing people's hearts and lives by calling them to himself through the gospel message, the good news of what his son Jesus has done for them. Now I want you to look with me for just a few minutes at this community, this new church in Jerusalem that is formed in response to the preaching of the gospel. And just think about a few characteristics that are true of them that could be and should be true of us as a family of believers here. The first thing you see on the screen there is that they were built on the gospel. What is it that makes a church a church? You know, you've probably been part of many different clubs and organizations in your life. Uh, when I lived in Mississippi for eight years, I was a member of the running and cycling club there. Now, what that meant is once a year I sent them money, and once a quarter they sent me a newsletter. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that really was it. I never once attended a meeting of the Golden Triangle Running and Cycling Club. I mean, my membership in that club was basically a name only. And yet sometimes we, we take that mentality of our membership in some kind of a social organization and we transfer that same form of thought to our participation, or lack thereof, in the church. But what brought these people together was a common belief in the message about Jesus, that climactic declaration in verse 36 of your text. Peter has defended this idea and now he announces it. God has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ, the one you crucified, God has exalted to be head over all. That's the declaration, and, and it is faith in that message that brings these people together. That's what makes a church a church. It is not coming from a common background. It is not belonging to the same social or economic class. It is not sharing a, a, a commonality in, our, in terms of our interests or our occupation. What brings people together in the church is a common belief in the message about Jesus. And if that is how the church appears, as it does in Acts chapter 2, then that is how the church will be built. How it will grow is by sharing that transformative message about Jesus with as many people as we can reach. God is calling them to himself, Peter says. And our part in that is not to go out and figure out how to convince someone to come and be part of this great church that we have. 
Evangelism is not about wooing people to an organization that offers programs that are appealing. Evangelism is about declaring this message and letting God call people to himself through it. And when that happens, the church grows. And the church grows the right way. The church grows this way by people coming together who believe this message. Now, look at verse 42. What do these people do? When they come together, they embrace this good news about Jesus. They hear God's call and respond to it in faith. What do they do? Well, verse 42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, would that be the first thing on the list in describing the activity of this church? If someone looked at you or looked at your group and said, well, I'll tell you what really characterizes that Broad Street church is they are devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Because honestly, I've traveled around a little bit. I'm sure Gary's traveled a lot more. I don't see a lot of churches that I would describe. I don't see a lot of churches that I would say that the defining characteristic is their devotion to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship as saints. I see churches that are devoted to a lot of things. And they may not even be bad things, but they're not this thing. I got to, to worship some with a church, a small church, a number of years ago. They didn't have a regular minister. They didn't have elders. They actually had very few men that were there even to, to participate in some of the leadership roles on an ongoing basis. I went there one Wednesday night, and they were studying Acts chapter 27. You don't know what's in Acts chapter 27. It's the story of Paul's journey by ship to Rome and the, the shipwreck that occurs. And it is a fascinating historical narrative, but it is incredibly hard for most people to see a great deal of theological truth in it. It's so embedded in the narrative that the average Bible class teacher is going to see nothing maybe but a story rather than a lesson about God's providence. And that evening, one of the men of the congregation got up, and he started at Acts 27, and he had the congregation recite chapter by chapter in reverse order the contents of every chapter in Acts. And then he proceeded to teach the best lesson on Acts 27 I've ever heard. And this man was not an elder. He was not a preacher. He didn't have any kind of theological training. He was just a man who was devoted to the teaching. And it was obvious how much time he'd spent immersed in that text. And we benefited from the overflow of this study. God's people in this church are characterized by their devotion to worship and edification. They are devoted to worshiping God and building each other up through the teaching that they are receiving from the apostles. Is that what really brings us together? Is that what really fills us, what inspires us, what makes us want to come? Is because we say, when I am in worship with my brethren, I feel close to God. You heard people pray that way? You heard a lot of people pray not that way. You heard people pray that you, you're afraid to open your eyes because you might see God standing there listening. You feel that close to Him. That's the way that our worship and our study and our fellowship should inspire, should transform. I'll tell you, you create that kind of a community, people will come. People will come when they see that we are devoted to a message and a relationship and a prayer life that is life-changing. Verse 43. I like the way the ESV translates this, by the way. There's some ambiguity in the text. The ESV says, And awe came upon every soul. I mean, wonders and signs were being done to the apostles. It's interesting that in the narrative of Acts, no one except the apostles works any demonstrable miracle until the end of Acts chapter 6, after they lay hands on Stephen and the other servants that are appointed at the beginning of that chapter. The apostles are doing miracles. The rest of the disciples are just standing in awe of everything that's been done and everything that's been seen. The ambiguity is, some would say, well, maybe the awe or the fear there is actually of the community, the, the larger Jerusalem community, and not of the church. But as you go forward in Acts, you see 
see that both statements are actually true. The people in Jerusalem are standing in awe of this church, and the members of that church are also walking in the fear of the Lord. They're characterized by reverence. They're serious about their faith. They stand in awe of who God is and what God is doing among them. The question is, do we? Do we have that kind of reverence? Do we feel that kind of fear? Do we sense his presence in that way? When you see God, as these people were seeing God work in their lives and within their fellowship, that changes things. You can't, you can't get a person to that point just by teaching. You can't get a person to that point just by getting them involved in programs or getting them to attend classes or getting them to sit in a pew. God has to do that. But when he does that, it will change everything. You will never be content just to sit and attend anymore. You have your warm up here. <coughs> You're not going to come because you have this responsibility. You're going to come because you need time with God and with his people. And you're going to come because God has so filled your life with power and joy and purpose and meaning that you want to come and be with others and share that joy with them also. Because you know, I can, I can be filled with the love of God at home in my prayer time, but I can't encourage other people here who need that encouragement today. There will be an awareness of God's presence and participation in our lives that will change everything. We will learn to live in that presence if we can find this power that's at work in the people here. Look at verses 44 and 45. These people don't consider anything that they own as belonging to them. <coughs> Don't you love people like that? Especially if they have something that you want. We want to see that unselfishness in other people. God wants to see it in you and me. Disciples realize that the call to follow Jesus is a call to surrender everything. When Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and to die, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. And he modeled his faith in that statement by dying because of his faith in Christ. That's right. That's what the Gospels show us. Jesus doesn't come to people and say, well, we say, here you go, here, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, be faithful, which means go to church until you die. That's it. You're good. That's not how Jesus approached people. In fact, Jesus would have people approach him and say, Lord, we will follow you anywhere. And he says, you can follow me anywhere. Really. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, some of them are the to He would have people come in Luke chapter 9 and say, Lord, I will follow you. First, let me go and bury my father. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. You follow me. Jesus would turn around in Luke chapter 14 and address a tremendous multitude of people who are interested in following him. And the first thing he would say is, whoever comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and his own wife cannot be my disciple. How would you like to start a sermon that way? That's how Jesus called it. People who hear that call, they realize, listen, following Jesus doesn't mean joining some organization. Following Jesus doesn't mean giving my Sunday morning to the church. Following Jesus means renouncing everything, divesting myself of all my goods, and surrendering myself as a living sacrifice every day. And so disciples of Jesus don't have anything that belongs to them. They don't have anything. They have a car. It's not their car. It's the Lord's car. They use it for me. They don't have a house. The Lord has a house. They use it for Him. They don't have food. They don't have money. The Lord has those things. He's given them to His disciples, to His, to his people, to use as stewards for Him in doing good in this world. These people don't care about their stuff. And stuff is what we fight over more than anything else. God forgive us. Verse 44. All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were 
were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. If you've never known someone who did that, your world that you've lived in is too small. Because there are people right now doing that very thing because of their faith and love for Jesus Christ and the way that He's working in their lives. And yet a lot of us church-going people, we go through our entire lives never realizing that kind of discipleship exists. In fact, I've taught classes in this passage many times. Many of you probably have too. It's a shame that the first question we get when we read Acts chapter 2 verse 44 is not how do we live out this passage today in our lives. The first question we get is, does that mean the early church practiced communism? We want to know the political implications. God forgive us. Talk about missing the point. That misses the point. All sin is rooted in pride and selfishness. The first thing that Jesus begins to do in our life when we come to follow him is he begins to root that out. And we need to be careful. I used to have people when I would travel around speaking in different places, I would teach on discipleship. That's the main thing I do. I have one lesson. I need preaching from all these different passages. <laughs> and I would preach these lessons. I would have people coming up to me afterwards and they would say, I am so glad that God doesn't command me to sacrifice my son the way that he did Abraham because I wouldn't be able to do that. Now, you may feel that way. And I can understand and appreciate that. But if you feel that way, don't tell Because as far as I'm concerned, that's exactly what God calls us. What he asks Abraham to do in Genesis 22 is demonstrate the kind of commitment that he is looking for in us all. And you may say, I'm not there yet. Okay, God can get you. I believe in God's power that changes the best. Make no mistake. Don't offer any excuse as if it's not, that's not the extent of where God wants to take me. That's not the extent to which I would be devoted to Christ. Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verse 33, whoever does not forsake all that he has, whoever does not forsake everything he has, cannot be my disciple. We need to be careful that we're not setting up idols in our lives. When we draw a line and we say, I'll give you this much, and I can't go beyond it. How much more do we know about faith? Because Abraham said, yes, Lord, I will. We know what it looks like. Look at verse 46. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Church wasn't Sunday for me. It wasn't Sunday morning, maybe Wednesday night. Yes, it was Sunday. It's so not the way these people looked at it. This is a family. Now I realize that some of us, I mean, you know, you may have a family that you say, I don't want to get together with my family every day. This family did. Church was not some place that they went. It wasn't something that they were doing. It's who they are. It's the life that they share. This is their family. And so they go to temple together. They eat together. Every day, they're sharing life. They're taking their food with glad hearts. Joy is characteristic of their, their typical spirit. And that does, that's not because they don't have problems. That doesn't mean that, that every moment they've just got this giddy, perky. I mean, you just can't stand people like that. You know, they're just always happy. No, it's not that way at all. It's this transcendent peace that no matter my circumstances, I know who Jesus is and what he's done for me. That changes everything. I may not enjoy that thorn in the flesh. I may not be real lit up about the fact that the Jewish authorities
authorities are running us out of town. But because of who Jesus is and what he's done, it changes everything. <coughs> and yet I meet Christians that go on and act like they were weaned on a dill pickle. I mean, you would think that the people who have got eternal life and are supposed to have eternal joy, they would be the happiest people in the world, and that would be evident to other people in their lives, but it's not. You know it's not. Some of you may be visiting today from the community. You may know that's not the case. Well, I could be unhappy at home. You know, I don't have to go to church to be unhappy. These people are not. Now, you look at these things and you say, why? If that's the way they were, why isn't that the way it is here? Why isn't it that way for me? Let me suggest to you that what we have to have is a paradigm shield. You know the reason I like to teach Acts 2 in Churches of Christ? Because it's the passage we think we know. If you hear me teach many classes, you're going to hear me say this a lot. The passages that we think we know the best have the most teachings. You know why that is? Passages we think we know, those are the passages that when we turn there, our eyes kind of glaze over. We just start doing this. Because we don't expect to learn it. We think we know what the teacher's already going to say. We're convinced we already know what the passage has to say. And as a result, we overlook a lot. I want you to think about changing the way we imagine the church. Go to the next slide. That instead of thinking about the church as an organization, we think about the church as an organism. See, we think about the church as an organization, and we think, well, it's organized. You know, we've got elders and deacons and ministers, and we've got all these volunteers that do all of these other things. And we, if we didn't have organization, I mean, we would fall apart, you know? And that's true. And organisms are organized, too. When you think of organization, you think of Apple, Google, Amazon. When you think of an organism, you think of something that's alive. A collection of mutually interdependent pieces that working together create something that's alive. That's the church in the New Testament. You cannot react and not see that, I don't think. As long as you think of the church as just an organization where you're a member, you're not going to see life like these Christians in Acts chapter 2 <coughs> so clearly saw. Go to the next one. Think about the church as an institution. We need to think about it as a relationship. You know, people say marriage. Marriage is an institution. That's right. Marriage is an institution. My marriage is not. My marriage is a relationship. Now, there's a sense in which you can talk about the church as an institution, and you can say, well, the Lord instituted marriage, the Lord instituted the church. We use that kind of formal language all the time. That's fine. There's a sense in which that's true. But if marriage is an institution, my marriage is a relationship. And if the church can, in one sense, be viewed as an institution, fine. This church needs to be a relationship. I mean, what does the word church mean anyway? You've got this fancy English term that like means something entirely different to us than it meant to first century Greek readers. It means assembly. It's a group of people that are called together for some purpose. That's all the word church means. It's a group of people. Yeah, we think of it as a place to go and things that we do and somewhere where we're a member instead of a relationship that we have. We think about church as an activity. We need to think about it as an identity. Be the church. Don't go to church. Don't do church. Don't be a member of church. Be the assembly. Be the group of people that are called together by their mutual faith in a risen Lord. And let that faith change your life, and through you, let God reach out to touch and to change other lives as well. When I started preaching the gospel full time 14 years ago, we had a lot of Bible schools, 
lot of people. I actually knew more now than I did then, but at the time, it seemed like a lot. And I would have preachers coming and say, where are you getting all these studies? You know, there's nobody to study with anymore. But that's because we're so busy fixing everything on Facebook. But anyway, people say, where are you getting all these studies? Where and we baptize a lot of people. Let me tell you. I mean, we have study with a person for, I would baptize you after we stay together for an hour. Three, four weeks tops. I've got you in the water, sign up your shirt, you're ready there, you show up the first Sunday, we don't see you again after that. And then I started living in the Gospels. Spending a few years reading Mark every week. Trying to get my mind wrapped around who Jesus is and how Jesus did ministry, and I start realizing he's not doing this at all the way I do. Jesus talks to thousands of people, and yet he challenges them with a message that would run a lot of people off, and did. And I decided that instead of using the approach that we'd always used, we need to be more focused on making disciples and helping people understand what discipleship. And I will tell you honestly, I've baptized fewer people as a result of that. But I am convinced God converts to me. And there is a difference. There's a profound difference. Now, have you been changed that way? Are you a church member, a church goer, or are you a disciple of Jesus? What is your conception of this relationship? If how you conceive of this is Broad Street is the place to go on this day at this time and these are the things that we do and then we kind of go back to real life. Folks, this is life. You never get realer than living in the presence of God. That's as real as it gets. It's the only thing we're giving. God is calling people to himself. We want to be vessels of grace to carry the gospel to people. If you're not willing to be a vessel of grace, then at least get out of the way. Because God is calling people to himself, and he will get them. He will find every one of them, and he will save them, and he will change them. And I want to be one of the ones that are and I want you to be as well. And if you want to be changed that way today, Let's see how we can help you mom stay together.